ideas and productivity are legendary in our lab. When, when uh, Ricardo and Mike Nisnikov get together, the lab sings with well-organized research activities. After many important discoveries of effects of ethanol during early development, Ricardo recently has been adapting his carefully worked out designs and techniques to adolescent rats and humans with exciting results. Ricardo's genius in organization, administration, and statistics has aided in his development and administration of international journals and research organizations, in addition to the remarkable research output and fine students. Since receiving his PhD less than 10 years ago, he has over 60 papers and, and chapters published in a variety of media, and usually in English, but sometimes in Spanish or Portuguese, and over 100 papers and, and invited presentations, while also teaching courses in research methods, statistics, and other topics at the <coughs> National University of, of uh, Cordoba. Incidentally, uh, what well, I mentioned the National University of Cordoba with respect to uh, Juan, and, and uh, I, I don't know how many of you know that it has over 100,000 students. <laughs> So, uh, oh, that's free. It's free. It's <laughs> <laughs> a little, a little <laughs> pull out of my, yeah, let's make it political here. We can talk all day. Uh, well, in any case, uh, uh, Ricardo's uh, uh, talk is Opera Self Administration of Ethanol. I changed it. Oh, changed. He'll tell you. There it is. Nice presentation. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I feel really honored to to be here and to to be part of, of your research team because I still feel part of, of the team and I'll keep like that all my life. So uh, it's been known for about a decade so far that the prevalence of alcohol use and abuse disorders is significantly greater during adolescence, particularly during late adolescence, than in any other developmental stage in life. What are the reasons, the mechanisms, <coughs> that could explain this phenomenon? There's a theory put forward by Dr. Linda Spear here from Binghamton University that states that age-related differences in the effects of alcohol could explain, at least partially, this phenomenon. And in the last years, in our lab, we have been gathering some data that seems to support this theory. For instance, adult rats do not exhibit preference for cues paired with effects of alcohol. As you can see in this figure, level of preference for a given CS that predicts the effects of alcohol is the same in adults regardless the cue predicts or not the effect of alcohol. That does not seem to be the case in adolescents. They exceed condition place preference for alcohol related cues. This is a small result, but an interesting one, because it seems to indicate differences in the perception of the rewarding appetitive effects of alcohol across these ages. Another proxy for ethanol induced reward is the stimulatory effect in terms of motor activity that rats exhibit when or mice as well when introduced in a novel environment. Adult rats, as you can see in the figure, they are barely sensitive to this effect. And the effect rapidly turns to motor depression, which lasts throughout the testing period. The white circles in the figure are the control groups, and as you can see, the uh, ethanol treated animals are all the time in the lower area of the graph. When you test adolescents in the very same behavioral task, not only they are sensitive to the stimulatory effect of alcohol, but they are completely insensitive to the motor sedative effect of the drug. Moreover, we have also observed recently in our lab that the promoting effect of passive exposure to alcohol on subsequent alcohol consumption seems to be much greater when it happens early in life during adolescence 
that when the same exposure to alcohol occurs during adulthood. In this experiment, we gave adolescent animals none exposure to alcohol, two or five exposure to alcohol using intubations. And a week later, we assess alcohol intake in a variety of tests. I'm showing just one of the tests. And as you can see, the adolescents that got alcohol before, then they drink more. The very same exposure to alcohol had absolutely no effect if the animals were 40, 50 days old. So it seems that we are tackling onto some ontogenetic differences in the effect of alcohol that may explain this, the first graph that we showed. Another factor that for about 50 or maybe more, 60 years, it's been around trying to explain alcohol intake is stress. And Dr. Marcelo Lopez will talk at great length about this issue. However, let me show you one experiment with this particular variable. In this two-hour drinking assessment that we did in our lab, we did not found, find any difference between alcohol intake between adolescents and adults. However, if the week before the animals had been given daily episodes of restrained stress, so if they had been given chronic stress, there's a dramatic and a significant increment in alcohol consumption, particularly the 4% concentration in adolescent animals. So it seems that <clears throat> adolescents are not only more sensitive to the positive effects of alcohol, but also they are more reactive to stress-induced drinking. So, I hope that by now we are somehow convinced that there, there are age-related differences between adolescents and adults, and that these, these differences are somehow related to greater alcohol consumption in the younger animals. However, how can we explain, or how can we find some population of adolescents that within their own age group are at greater risk when compared, not to adults, but when compared to their own peers. So the idea is to target a specific population of adolescents that may require specific treatment prevention and approach. <clears throat> but before jumping on to the animal models, let me show you some data we've been gathering in humans. <coughs> These are almost 600 students from this university that the skip just mentioned, the National University of Cordoba, that we divided in five classes using a statistical approach called latent class analysis as a function of their level of engagement in alcohol and other drugs. From people who were, let's say, abstainers, to people that drink a little bit of alcohol, a little bit more. They, they drink alcohol and also show some signs of binge drinking, like drunkenness. And then what we call polydrug users. And then we measured in those subjects personality and alcohol expectancy variables. And we found that the classes, the groups of subjects, that engaged the most in alcohol and other drug use exhibit more extroversion, less responsibility, more impulsiveness, and more aggression. Moreover, they expected more positive things about alcohol. They expected more of alcohol-induced social facilitation, alcohol-induced social relaxation, yet they expected to have less alcohol-negative consequences, like feeling guilty or regret about their consumption. So it seems that these studies are very good to get us closer to the idea of finding a group of people that are greater risk than others. However, as, as good as these studies are, they have the typical pitfalls of human research. For instance, we may, we may have the question, is impulsivity a cause or a consequence of alcohol consumption? Or is it related to a genetic component? So, to answer, to try to get closer, we get to our more analytical animal models, to our 
stats. Let me show you some of those stats. You may remember that adolescents were more sensitive to alcohol-induced motor stimulation. So in another experiment, we divided between animals, rats, adolescents, that were more sensitive or less sensitive to these particular effects, we call high and low responders. And we found that when compared to a naive group, only the high responders drank more alcohol than the controls. This is a two-hour test, and we also found the effect in a 24-hour test. Although in this particular case, the effect was kind of short-lasting and restricted to females. Remember I told you that in humans, in that study with humans, impulsiveness or novelty-seeking was a good predictor of belonging to the high-risk class. One way to measure novelty-seeking in rats is to measure how much they move in a new environment. Just in a typical 50-year-old open field test. By doing that, we found that those that move the more in an open field test exceed less evenly induced condition based aversion, which is a very reliable and sensitive test for the aversive negative effects of alcohol. Moreover, those very same animals, the ones that move the more, also exhibit more ethanol induced condition place preference, which is the other side of the donut coin, the appetitive effect of alcohol. It seems that we are getting closer to this idea of finding predictors of alcohol reward in this particular. We also tackle into the issue of baseline level of anxiety. If you put animals in an elevated plus maze, which is a maze which has open and closed sections, most of the animals, or many animals, will barely enter into the open spaces. However, some proportion of the animals will spend about one third of the time in the open spaces. We call these the high anxiety animals and these the low anxiety. So we also measure consumption in those animals. We were expecting, of course, the high anxiety animals to drink the more. Well, that was not the case. The high anxiety animals drink much less alcohol than the other. But remember, this is just a 24-hour test. A single, no, not only that, an 18-hour test. So we believe that perhaps these animals are more afraid of everything. They are reluctant to engage in any stimulus that is going on at the same time. So we've said, we told us ourselves, well, perhaps they need more experience with alcohol. They need repeated exposure to alcohol to learn about the reinforcing effects of the drug. With this idea in mind, we did another experiment in which we improved on the old one. We not only used one test to divide between high and a low anxiety the animals, but we use two tests. The elevated plus maze and a light dark book test that takes advantage of the natural avoidance that Rollins show for open bright spaces. We standardized the scores of these two tests and got a single score that indicates whether the animals has high anxiety or low anxiety. And then we created our classes. And after this, we assess alcohol intake not once, but 12 times throughout adolescence. This is postnatal day 30, when adolescence just began, and this is postnatal day 60, when animals are entering adulthood. First, the animals start responding for slightly sweetened uh, alcohol with 1% sucrose, but by the end, it's just plain 5% and these are the results for those sessions when alcohol is alone. No sweetener, no sucrose. And as you can see, the high anxiety start low, so similar to the, to the old experiment. But then they peak and they surpass the average anxiety responders, which are more or less at the same time across the sessions. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, we can block this effect completely if the animals are even stressed immediately prior to each test session, just before given the option to drink alcohol, if they are restrained, if they are exposed to stress, they don't prefer the drug. So
So one concern that you may have at this particular moment is that I'm just showing snapshots of how different variables relate to alcohol intake. And it's a very, very, very valid concern. The other important concern is that as significant in terms of statistics as these results are, how relevant are to explain actual alcohol intake? Some of these effects were not related to intake, but just to reward or to aversive effects of alcohol. Well, those are really valid concerns. And we have just tried to address, at least partially, those concerns. We, uh, we uh, created a model, and through a regression, um, multiple regression model, we tried to explain alcohol intake as a function of several of these big variables that I just described, in adolescent rats. And basically, the model proved significant and explained 22% of the variability in, on, in alcohol intake scores, which was deemed by one of the reviewers as low, but we, we can always improve. And one of the current direction is to try to improve our capability of explaining the phenomenon. Interestingly enough, the very same variables did not explain sucrose consumption. So only explain alcohol consumption. Another concern that you may have is, can we go back to humans? Can we use this information in humans and try to explain alcohol trajectories of alcohol consumption in humans? We have just begun a longitudinal study, not with 600 students as we did before, but with 4,500 students that just entered the National University of Cordoba, and we are entering in the second uh, testing, let's call of them, in the second wave of assessment, and the aim is to try to assess those uh, guys and girls for five years, and to assess the predictive value of the very similar variables that we are mentioning in rats, and on top of that, many others. For instance, we are asking in which neighborhood do you live, and we are trying to correlate the number of alcohol outlets in the neighborhood with the consumption of the youth. So let me let me make a concluding remark and some summary. Uh, on top of the idea that age-related difference may underlie the greater alcohol intake in adolescents, we added some confirmation of that theory in terms of hedonic responding to alcohol. Among the adolescents, though, that those that exhibit greater response to novelty, greater response to the stimulating effect of a drug, and greater anxiety might be, might be more likely to drink. So it seems that we get a little step closer to indicate some early markers of alcohol consumption in this population that could be used for targeting specific populations. There are many current directions and results I'm not showing to you, like, for instance, we are trying to get inside the brain, trying to see whether there are uh, molecular markers of this. We are interested in delta fos B, which is a gene that accumulates after substantial exposure to drugs. We are interested in changes in the in kappa and NOP receptors in the brain. Also, of course, we are also interested in how this, all these phenomena can be modulated by prior exposure either to alcohol or to stressors, stressors such as maternal separation. That, that, that's another story. So just a, snap, uh, just a snapshot of all the people that were involved in this experiment, all the students, graduate students, postdoctoral students, undergraduate students. Dr. Nishnikov, she's my co-worker for life, I hope. Uh, Angelina is uh, the, the main researcher in the human studies. Dr. Camarini is my, my, my collaborator in Brazil. Juan Carlos Molina was my mentor during all my undergrad years and throughout, throughout my career in general. And I feel very grateful to you, Juan. And then, this is the new generation of students that we have, as well as cooperation with the other life, yourself, it's over there, all from Uruguay. And of course, my completely gratitude to you, Skip, for all the help throughout this year and all, all the years. Thank you.